this video we're going to look at uh, deep foundations. As mentioned before, uh, foundations are normally grouped into shallow and deep foundations. Uh, deep foundations are more expensive than shallow foundations, uh, but they are often required where you have a high loading um, due to the, the load of the building. So it could be a high rise building or it could be a bridge, uh, or and or because the soil is not strong enough, the surface soil, the top 2-3 metres is not strong enough to support the structure. Uh, usually it's a combination of both. Uh, there are different ways that co um, the way that deep foundations work is by having piles um, connected together in a pile cap at the top. Um, we'll talk more about how piles work in the next slide. The different types of uh, deep foundation uh, displacement piles which is like a nail being hammered into a bit of wood um, the material is pushed uh, the soil is pushed um, to the sides as the pile is driven in uh, as compared to a replacement pile where the soil is removed and replaced with the pile so there's the two differences between them so the pile classification the way piles work uh, two different ways. First of all, end bearing, where the pile acts like um, to transfer the load down to a sound soil or a bedrock or some sort of strong material that can support the load. Um, so, uh, in a purely end bearing column uh, pile, the um, the pile would uh, be bearing the the whole load would be transferred down to the bedrock. Uh, there's also friction the friction between the soil and the uh, and the pile itself and sometimes you can um, corrugate the pile to increase that friction uh, but usually it's a combination uh, end bearing and friction uh, you can imagine that with a uh, with a cohesive soil um, friction would be quite significant whereas with a non-cohesive soil like a sand or a gravel there wouldn't be much um, friction between the or significant friction between the piles and the um, and the soil. So the pile foundation is usually a system. It's not just a whole lot of piles. The piles are actually tied together with a pile cap or a slab um, or a series of foundation beams. But somehow the piles are actually tied together. Um, with one structure so that pole there is not just taking the load from above um, the load from above has been transferred to the piles around it as well uh, and that way you're sort of utilizing your piles to maximum effect uh, it also means that you're lessening the chance of differential sediment between the piles so that's what the pile cap does or it could be a pile slab or a foundation beam um, transfers the load more evenly between the, the piles there are different types of piles, as I said, uh, displacement piles. Uh, the main type is driven piles. This is where you just bash the pile into the ground. Um, the soil is displaced laterally, which increases the um, friction between the pile and the and the soil. Uh, and so you're getting some soil friction um, uh, starting to develop with, the, with these type of piles. Uh, they're usually precast and they can be steel, they can be reinforced concrete uh, or they can be timber. With timber and concrete they can splinter with the impact of the hammer, uh, even with steel piles they can sort of bear over so often you'll have a little helmet on top so here you can see a timber pole being bashed in with a pole driver so that hammer lifts and drops, lifts and drops uh, and there's the steel um, helmet on top of it uh, basically so that the hammer is impacting on the steel helmet which distributes the load around the top of the pile and stops it from splintering. Uh, in this one here you can see a um, concrete pile being driven. Uh, once again this unit here sits on top of there. It doesn't lift. There's a hammer inside it which goes up and down but the unit actually sits on the end of the pile um, of the concrete pile. Once again so you don't have a direct impact between the hammer and the the concrete or the concrete pile in this case because the hammer would actually start splintering uh, breaking cracking the pile 
the way driven poles work is they either driven to a set depth so the geotechnical engineer would have said we need to get down to 15 meters because there's a layer of bed bedrock there but more common you're measuring the set the set is how much how, what distance what depth the pole moves with every hit so the geotechnical engineer will look at the pole driving unit being used and then he'll say uh, when the the pole driving when each impact can only drive at a certain distance then we've reached the resistance that we're looking for and the pile has um, is achieving what it needs to achieve so sets like three or five mils so it may be um, there'll be someone measuring it there and if it's if it's um, moving less than three or five mils whatever is specified per hit then he says we've achieved the required set we can go on to the next one uh, the person on the ground is also looking at the verticality of the pole when it's being driven it needs to be straight up and down if that's what is required uh, in two directions so he'll be looking at um, both the both x and y directions to make sure that it's totally vertical uh, as it's going down um, with these pile driving rigs um, this one not not this one here you can actually move the helmet round so you can actually tweak it a little bit so if it's starting to go offline you just tweak it over and start bringing it back into line same with this unit here you can see that it can be raked back and forth just to sort of um, tweak it as it goes and just keep it um, moving down into vertical uh, same with uh, sheet piling units um, another version of this is sheet piles um, you recall that sheet piles are driven by vibration so instead of having a, a hammer there there's a rotating weight which is vibrating the unit and pushing it into the ground and once again you'll recall that sheet piles also need to be driven down vertical there's someone on the ground that's watching them as they go uh, the problem with driven piles is uh, when you're using a hammer it's noisy but it is it is simple to operate obviously uh, vibration which is a vibrating um, eccentric weight moving around uh, a little bit less noisy but it does create vibrations in the ground so if there are brick ho houses or something close by then you could crack them so you need to be monitoring the surrounding structures when you're using hammers or vibration equipment uh, that you're not damaging the the material um, the structures around it uh, I had a case once where we were driving sheet piles um, into a soft marine sediment we had a brick wall right next to it it didn't crack but the houses up the road did crack because when we got down to the rock the vibrations was being spread through the bedrock and the houses up the road were um, founded on bedrock whereas the retaining wall was founded on the marine sediments so you need to look at the houses in the area rather than just the ones closest to it uh, driven cast in situ piles so in this case here we drive a casing steel casing usually into the ground uh, then we um, you can see that it's got a closed end there usually it would be more pointed than anything else so you drive it into the ground and so you've got an open ended tube driven into the ground you would then put uh, reinforcing uh, into the, um, the tube uh, pour concrete into it and then in this case here they're pulling the steel casing out while it's still wet so that means that the concrete sort of settles into this um, corrugated uh, fashion which provides a better friction between the, the pile and the, and the surrounding ground uh, that would also help with tension as well um, with piles you want them to be able to resist tension in case of overturning forces as well as compression uh, then you can see here they're also pumping uh, concrete down to put a bell in as well so this is the Frankie pile construction um, drilled board piles um, this is the second type of, of pile this is displacement so you drill a hole and then you build the pile inside the hole so you, you are removing the soil out of the hole uh, it's for large diameter piles um, the driven ones can only go up to about 300 400 mils after that the resistance the soil poses to the pile being driven is just too much it'll start shattering the um, the pile before it actually um, goes into the ground so once you start getting above 400 300 400 mils you need to start drilling holes and then building it inside 
Uh, it can go through hard strata, obviously driving, it's very hard to drive a pile through a hard strata, but it's easy to drill through. Uh, can be cased or uncased depending on the soil type. Um, one of the problems you're having is you're leaving an open hole and you need to build the pile inside of it. So how do you keep that hole open while you're building the pile? And um, one of the common ways of doing that is drilling fluids such as bentonite slurry. Uh, so here's the most common piece of equipment used to um, do rotary piling, rotary drilling. Um, this unit here, so you can see that it's got an excavator type thing, but this is a specialised piece of equipment, but it's got the tracks, it's got the turntable there, it's got the um, cab there, hydraulically driven tracks and stuff like that. So uh, excavator type body, but it's much bigger and it's mounted and connected to the boom is this um, rotary piling rig. Uh, this one here is a bucket um, excavator, so what it does is it drills into the ground, um, fills up the bucket, pulls out, turns around, drops the soil, goes back. So it's basically taking little bites, spitting them out, going in bites, spitting them out as it goes. So it takes a bit of time to, to do it, but it's obviously quite a good way of doing things. This is another example, this is an um, auger. So the auger rotates around and the soil's actually um, driven up the auger and then spills over the side. So you don't um, Sometimes, uh, this is actually just an uh, auger bit, so you'll fill up the auger with the soil and then you will turn around and drop it. Um, sometimes you have continuous flight augers, which is the auger going all the way down and it will actually excavate and move the soil up and then it will spill over the sides. But this one here has only got about three turns of the auger, so I'm assuming that it just goes in, digs about a metre of soil, um, comes out and then drops it off to one side around there somewhere. Uh, you can see that this one here is a unit, so they must have dropped it in with a crane and it's got its hydraulics being connected to something off in the distance there. Uh, once again you can see that on the drill rig there, the drill rig slides up and down. There's the turntable there, so there's a little motor there sort of turning this. Um, uh, and then the uh, the drill lifts out by going up and down this, this guide here. This guide also helps you to get verticality on your drill. As I mentioned, when you are opening up um, a hole, you um, have the risk of it all collapsing in on yourself. So oftentimes they'll use what's called bentonite slurry. Uh, bentonite slurry is like um, water, a consistency of water, um, but it's got um, bentonite, which is a clay mixed in with it. Um, and what you do is you maintain uh, the hole full of bentonite. So the drill can drill within the, the within the fluid, but the fluid actually holds the sides um, uh, open. Uh, normally, about a meter of head over top of the um, of the ground level will be enough to actually maintain an open um, excavation. Uh, bentonite is also used to remove the slurry, uh, remove the material that's been excavated. So you pump it in, it circulates around, supports it, and that can be withdrawn, treated, and then returned back into the mix. Um, the removed material um, is taken off to disposal. When you have drilled the hole down to the required level, you put a tremie into the hole, which is like a big long pipe and you start pumping, or sorry, you put the reinforcing steel in first, then you put a tremie in, and then you start pumping in the concrete underneath, and as the concrete rises, the um, bentonite gets pushed out. So there's a picture of the bentonite slurry being mixed up, and there it's being inserted. So there's the unit, the cleaning unit, and you can see they're pumping it in there. There is the drilling rig, uh, there's the turntable, and it's going up and down um, on, the, on the guide there. Another thing that piles need to do is they need to resist tensile forces. They are not only transferring the load to the ground, they are also um, resisting uplift forces. So if you've got um, strong winds or if you've got overturning forces, um, some of the piles actually have to resist being pulled out of the ground. And one way of doing that is to put a bell in the bottom there, and that's called under-reaming. So this unit here, um, these arms close in, it drills down to the required level, so you can see that it's um, they've 
they've drilled it using conventional means and then they get the under reaming unit in and um, once it gets down to the level um, the arms are actually pushed out as it rotates so it rotates and the arms are gradually pushed out to form a bell shape in the bottom there uh, and then as it goes up these arms actually you can see that they're serrated there would actually be spun to provide a more corrugated sides to the excavation as well so that's uh, so the under reaming is putting the bell in there the bell provides a resistance against um, uh, uplift forces uh, it means the pole can act in tension as well as in compression the bell also provides a much higher end bearing area so the um, pressures on the ground are less because of the bell um, so once again you're increasing the compression the compressive uh, capacity of the pile as well